So hello and welcome to the Unequal Exchange podcast. And today we're talking a little bit about Ricardo. We're talking today about David Ricardo's theory of comparative advantage and how this theory is a part of the set of, of theories that justify free trade that Emmanuel is criticizing throughout Unequal Exchange. Um, yeah, to begin, I guess, Peter, why why are we talking about comparative advantage and what is its relation to trade and, and Emmanuel's criticism of the imperialism of trade? Yeah, so comparative advantage, uh, it was it's this idea that's created by David Ricardo, this really influential um, Scot- uh, British economist from the 19th century. Uh, we'll talk a bit more about his particular idea and so on soon. But basically, it was the point of this idea is to justify free trade as being mutually beneficial for all countries involved. And the really, the really important thing about it, and this is why it was different from Adam Smith's conception, which came before of, of free trade, um, is that even if one country is uh, weaker in all industries, it has lower productivity in all industries, than another country, it'll still be, according to comparative costs, beneficial for the weaker country to engage in free trade, uh, which is something that David uh, Adam Smith's theory uh, did not believe in, and you know most theories did not believe in before that. So it's quite revolutionary in that sense. Until then, basically, you know, economic theory, uh, especially what you know was known as mercantilist theory, which is kind of the dominant economic mode of thought in Europe for the first couple of centuries of capitalism assumed that obviously free trade benefits the strong countries and is bad for the weak countries. And this was just and the whole point of economics was to figure out how to become strong, how to dominate the poor, the poor countries. And um, and but then Ricardo's idea is like no free trade is good for everyone. Um, and this whole idea that he creates of comparative costs has been incredibly influential. I mean like influential is not even Right. It's like a gospel, like every single, like for centuries, it's survived as this totally infallible conception that can never be challenged. Every, you know, mainstream economist and also lots of even of, of uh, Marxist economists also, they're saying, oh, you know, this is great. Um, mainstream economists think it's amazing and you'll always just see references to comparative costs in especially stuff like IMF different reports and World Bank they always talk about comparative costs and factor endowments, which is the more sort of modern version of it. We'll also talk about uh, as justifying, and this is the ultimate justification basically for neoliberal economics, uh, not the only justification, but it is, it is the ultimate justification for opening up free trade, uh, opening up poor countries to free trade. Uh, which, you know, in the manual's theory, you can see it's very destructive. In reality, you can see it's very destructive. So Emmanuel spends lots of time critiquing this theory, uh, which his specific critiques we'll, we'll talk about in future episodes. But in this episode, we, was, we sort of wanted to explain what is comparative cost, this theory, give us some historical context, because Emmanuel discusses it, but it can be a little bit difficult to understand uh, for readers who aren't totally acquainted with it. Um, and we can also try and help with some basic text to read about it to help you guys uh, figure it out on your own as well. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So in this episode, we want to begin with the historical context that Ricardo came up with the theory in. And, and like you mentioned, explain a little bit about how his theory then from the, the history that he was engaged in was used to justify free trade. So I'll begin talking a little bit about the history that preceded Ricardo uh, that he then used and was inspired by to create the theory of comparative advantage. So one of the the inspirations that we could say we could draw as like the origin point to some extent of comparative advantage as a theory is the Treaty of, of Methuen. So this is a treaty signed between England and Portugal in 1703. And it signed after the War of the Spanish Succession. We're not going to go into all aspects of that, but one interesting detail that I found was that essentially Portugal was allied with France during the war, and the French had assured the Portuguese that 
they had complete supremacy over the water and the navy and their navy was in control of the waters outside of portugal no one could attack or advance to portugal the portuguese waters and the british disproved that by sailing one of their naval ships right across on the on the sea line on the horizon across from lisbon and the portuguese believed that the english naval supremacy really did out outmatch that of france so they switched sides and this is where the anglo portuguese alliance that has lasted for centuries and still to this day to some extent uh has has originated in the british naval supremacy so after the war or to cement their alliance the british and the portuguese signed this trade this trade treaty a commercial treaty one of the the most famous parts of this treaty is called the port wine treaty which established trading relations between england and portugal and in essence allowed portuguese wines to be imported into england with a third less of the duty on wines that were imported from france and in exchange the English cloth or textile industry was given basically a free of duty admission into Portugal. And Ricardo has this table, very famous. I saw this in high school uh, in the US, in US economics, with this very simple table that says like the hours or units uh, of production of Portuguese wine and cloth and English wine and cloth, and basically says the Portuguese should specialize in wine and the English should specialize in cloth, which is what happened. Historically, Berlin, uh, John Berlin, who wrote The Bias of the World, also has a very interesting quote that we, we read for this. We read Ricardo's Principles on Political Economy. And Ricardo has this very interesting quote where he says that the, the system of perfectly free commerce, by stimulating industry, by rewarding ingenuity, and by using more efficaciously the peculiar powers bestowed by nature, distributes labor most effectively and most economically, while by increasing the general mass of productions, it diffuses general benefit and binds together one common tie of interest and intercourse, the universal society of nations throughout the civilized world. It is this principle which determines that wine shall be made in France and Portugal, that corn shall be grown in America and Poland, and that hardware and other goods shall be manufactured in England. So essentially laying the groundwork for an international division of labor that requires that countries specialize in the comparative commodity that they have the advantage in but will lay the groundwork for Emmanuel to criticize this in this international division of labor as benefiting the countries the high-waged countries um, that, that mainly produce manufactured uh, commodities so, Peter, I wonder if we could talk a little bit more about this history of Anglo-Portuguese trade and how it laid the groundwork for Ricardo to spell out comparative advantage. Yeah, the the really funny, this seems like some kind of awful English humor uh, poking fun of its uh, colonial appendage because in uh, in Ricardo, his example with Portugal and England, in his example, Portugal is more productive than England in both wine and cloth. This is an example, uh, which is obviously not true in reality. Um, but his whole argument is that even if one country is more productive in both sectors, it's still better uh, for one country to specialize in what it's better at um, domestically. So if it's I mean, you can look at the thing, it's kind of hard to explain, but if you look at it on paper, it makes sense. Um, but we can sort of explain it. It's, it's not that difficult to explain. It's that um, Portugal is more productive at making wine than making cloth, but both wine and cloth can be produced in Portugal uh, at a higher productivity with less labor hours required than England. But England, uh, produces cloth more productively than it produces wine. And even though British cloth is still less productive than Portuguese cloth, he says that still uh, Britain will specialize in cloth and Portugal in wine, and it will be better for everyone involved. Uh, so it'll benefit everyone. Um, so, and then the ironic thing is, is that he's saying that Portugal is the most productive in everything, when in reality, Portugal was quite a lot less productive in both. And the reality was that 
um, you know, this relation of dependency, this trade, uh, free trade agreement, it just reinforced this dependency and reinforced Portugal's status, this kind of raw material exporter, um, and so on. Uh, I think there was also something interesting in Roland where he talked about how England also used its trade with Poland in order to receive bullion from, Latin, from Portuguese Latin American colonies, uh, which was really important in yeah. terms of uh, maintaining a rising money supply during Britain's industrialization and so on. Um, but so, yeah, it's it's really obvious how Ricardo's theory is this justification of, in fact, the very you know, one-sided relationship where Britain industrialized, became the richest country in the world, became, you know, the first capitalist sort of industrialized country in the world, and then had a captive market in uh, in Poland, I'm sorry, in, uh, in Portugal, which it used to export goods from, uh, to, and then also receive cheap sort of consumer goods from. Um, so it's, it's very like apologetic in that sense for free trade, and you can see how it's used today as well. But there's a couple of other really interesting things that I wanted to kind of learn. And one thing is like that quote you read out. I wanted to talk about that quote as well, but it's so incredibly colonial. You know, you can really sense this whole conception of um, the whole, because the whole idea of comparative costs is that if each country specializes in something, if it does, if, it, if, if each country is totally specialized, you'll have greater global production of goods than if each country was diversified. So it's this kind of idea about higher consumption, higher total consumption. Um, and I mean, that's, that, this is how the chapter begins, basically, is that um, extension of foreign trade will always very powerfully contribute to increase the mass of commodities and therefore the sum of enjoyments. And that's how um, you know, all sort of free trade liberal theory always justifies it. The more trade you have, the more consumption, the better it is for everyone. And his example with the wine and the cloth shows that after specialization, you have more wine and cloth than you had before specialization. Um, but then you can also think about, you know, John Stuart Mill, and he was also, you know, a very big free trader and so on after Ricardo. And, uh, you know, he would write about how, you know, colonialism is necessary in Africa because these countries, uh, they don't know how to labor like they should uh, as, as, you know, capitalist workers and so on, producing goods for the global market. And if we don't enslave them, they won't they won't produce these goods. And you can see in this sort of conception of a global, and you know, John Stuart Mill was this famous, you know, liberal and so on and so on. But it makes sense in this whole conception of we want to have more consumption in the whole world. And if you're not producing stuff for the global market, that's decreasing global consumption, you know. Um the other really fascinating, I mean, Ricardo's really interesting to read. He's a lot more fun to read, I think, than lots of like modern economists we were reading a fair bit of Olin and Heckscher for this episode which is extremely boring and unpleasant we'll get to that later but Ricardo is quite a clear writer but he has lots of really interesting um ideas that are very relevant to Emmanuel as well like I mean Ricardo has this idea which is not really talked about much in chapter seven about foreign trade but it's in the previous chapters as I recall of the book to talk about rent, talk about wages. Basically, he has this idea that as population uh, grows in England, as there are more workers, this will increase rent because there'll be more demand for food food products. So then landowners will get higher rents. Uh, and then the cost of corn and different food goods will continue increasing. And then this will cut into profits because the wages of workers will get too high. And then you have this kind of apocalyptic scenario where there's no more profits anymore and capitalism fails. Basically, he, had to, he was really terrified about this. Um, and it's really interesting because this shows the need, the in, crucial importance of receiving cheaper uh, consumer goods from abroad. And that's why he always has this, he always talks in his book about the need, you know, Polish corn. Uh, you know, in this example that you read, this is why corn shall be grown in Poland, right, and America. But um and this was a really big historical context of Ricardo's theories as well the fight against the uh, the corn laws which was a uh, you know basically a protectionist ban 
on imported corn and Ricardo was really fighting against it and so on. And his he was a parliamentarian. As a, he was a businessman, but he became this economist, the parliamentarian, defending his views. His views became very popular in England. And eventually they got rid of the corn laws and it was this you know, huge win for the Ricardian community. But it wasn't just, it's not just obviously his ideas. Like you can see how he was really talking about these problems that, you know, England was facing as a, you know, this imperialist capitalist country. And this is the really basics of unequal exchange, right? But basically wages are rising uh, and we need to accommodate that somehow. And the only way to, to accommodate them, uh, you know, in order to not cut into profits, cut into profits, capitalism fails, the capitalists go elsewhere, there's no, there's no more industrial growth and stuff, is we need to have cheaper goods imported, cheaper consumer goods. And, that, and how, how can we do that? Import them from Poland. Um, and I mean, this is kind of a bit of a side note, but the history of Poland at this time is one of like basically three centuries of just the most precipitous decline imaginable, where Poland just became addicted to exporting. Uh, I mean, it was, it was called, well, different different grain basically, and it just it literally destroyed Poland, and Poland became divided among you know among Russia and Austria and so on, Prussia, because it it became so dependent on exporting uh, these raw materials to England and so on. And it destroyed the economy. Uh, everyone became incredibly poor because there were just landowners in charge of the country that just required just incredibly low wages, no industry, all industry destroyed. The cities disappeared because the landowners just took over. There was no real state. It was just a bunch of landowners just with private armies and the country just just literally got destroyed by corn. Um, so anyway, that, that, there's, there's lots of fascinating stuff in Ricardo that you can find, really. Yeah, I really wanted to mention what you, you mentioned about Brazil. Uh, I thought what, what Berlin has in his text about it is quite interesting, where the basically the duty reduction on um on portuguese wine had almost already existed since the 1690s so that part of it wasn't really giving portugal that much um it wasn't anything new necessarily but england on its part was almost able to get it access to the portuguese market with its with its cloth exports and by so doing was able to sell to the brazilian market obtained brazilian bullion which he quotes the author Sideri, he says this bullion was so essential if her monetary circulation was to keep pace with expanding production and trade. I'm I'm curious. I, this is a bit you know further down the line with Emmanuel's different theories, but that part reminded me of the discussions that Emmanuel has at least in the beginning of a profit and crises, where he talks about the the view of of needing to sell to the rest of the world, like the person who sells can bring in money to the economy and keep the economy in circulation. And I was kind of wondering why, why, like in these fundamental debates between the mercantilists and the free traders, why, as you were just mentioning with Ricardo being very much a vocal free trader, they, they kind of see mercantilism as, as dangerous to uh, the economy when mercantilism had, I guess, benefited some of the imperial, especially like early Britain's early industrialization. Why make that switch over to free trade later on? That's such a fascinating question. I mean, Emmanuel's answer is basically that he, this is in Profit and Crises as well, where he talks about mercantilism. I mean, for the listeners, mercantilism is basically, basically the economic this is what it's called nowadays, the economic theory that was, it's not really a, an economic theory. The basics of it, I guess, if, when it's usually summarized, is that it's good to have an export surplus. It's good to export more than you import. Um, and that should be the aim of economic activity. And, uh, and that state intervention can be helpful for this aim and so on. This is the 16th, 17th centuries and so on, 18th centuries. And then came along Adam Smith. Uh, and it was also some other guys already were criticizing it as well before Adam Smith, but um, Adam Smith really criticized it a lot, and so did Ricardo, and then it just became really fashionable to like hate the cantalism and all economists like cantalism is so stupid. They thought they like say like oh the cantalists they just love they they have a the Midas illusion where they think that uh, money is 
all you need. But in fact, and they're like, but that's so stupid. Actually, we need to have lots of goods, lots of consumption. Um, but it will, this is definitely a topic for a later episode because it's quite an interesting and really important and complicated part of Emmanuel's thought. But Emmanuel basically agreed with the mercantilists and says that it's in capitalism's nature uh, to require an export surplus. Well, if, if a capitalist country is going to have rising employment, rise wages, it needs to have an export surplus and to basically exploit other countries, force them to import a lot, ruin their economies. Uh, but then the exporting country will be uh, well off. And uh, so he agrees with the mercantilists. But he says basically that the reason for the switch away from mercantilism is because um, there began to be uh, a, re a, ne a real necessity to justify capitalism, theoretically. Uh, and there began to be, you know, I mean, anti-capitalist struggles within the imperialist metropoles. Um, but also, you know, I think you could also talk about anti-imperialist as well struggles were taking place. I mean, this is already after the, the Haitian Revolution, for instance. And, um, and in general, there were a lot of, you know, questions being, you know, raised about you know, slavery and um, and so on and so on. And um, so you couldn't really continue saying, yeah, capitalism, the point of, you know, economics and, you know, is to exploit other countries, which is what the mercantilists said. And mercantilists were, they weren't just economists. They were often uh, like merchants and, you know, princes of little city states and stuff. They're very practical people uh, engaged in, in the economy. And so, but then you have all these kind of, this kind of emergence of pure economists, basically. Like, uh, I mean, uh, Ricardo was businessman earlier in life, but, but then more and more, I see this nowadays, like every economist, like mainstream economists, uh, they'll just be like a pure economist, like an academic, right? And it's very, quite distant from economic reality often. Uh, and, uh, but then it becomes, economics becomes more of a science of justification of capitalism, finding of, finding ways to like rationally justify, you know, and this is basically with Ricardo with comparative cost. It's like, it's not really an attempt to explain international trade so much as it is an attempt to justify international trade and free trade. Uh, in this like rational rational needs, I find that really a really compelling um, answer by Emmanuel. Um, on on that topic, I think it's also one thing that I find really interesting about comparative cost is that I mean Ricardo he was kind of the most rigorous uh, ex ex exponent uh, of the uh, labor theory of value, and Marx really loves Ricardo for his explanation of labor theory of value. Marx's explanation is quite similar to Ricardo's, or it's most similar to Ricardo's of all the different authors that Marx writes about, although Marx is also uh, modified in certain respects. But um, uh, but the thing with Ricardo is, is that he abandons the labor theory of value when it comes to international trade, because the whole point of comparative cost is that it's no longer the minimum labor required which determines uh, Price the international market. Now it's this whole weird. I mean, if it was well, if it was necessary labor value, this would be absolute costs, and that's Adam Smith's theory of international trade, which is that it's absolute costs which determine absolute, which determine uh, you know international trade. And then you can just have like you know, if one country is more productive at both products, then it just dominate the other country in every way, and the other country has nothing. And then you can have like actual loss in international trade. And Ricardo kind of changes this, like oh no no, you can have comparative costs in every country can have something to specialize in. There'll be no trade deficits and it, it's fine. Everything will balance itself out. And uh, so the point being that Ricardo abandons the labor theory of value when it comes to international trade. And I think there's lots of really interesting things to think about with that, like in this sort of way that the it's more necessary than ever to justify capitalism at the international level, and this is where you have the greatest exploitation, essentially like the greatest uh, extraction, I guess, of, of value through an equal exchange. And that's where um, the justificatory, sort of apologetic uh, essence of ideology becomes more important than analysis, really. Um, yeah. And, and I mean, also on that note, I just also want to say that 
Emmanuel then picks up from Ricardo. And Emmanuel tries to build a theory of international prices based on the labor theory of value. Um, and this is like Emmanuel tries to continue this materialist aspect of Ricardo, but on international scale. Uh, and this is why Emmanuel is a great Marxist economist, specifically a Marxist economist, because he tries to like look at uh, Marxist materialist uh, method, but on the international scale, which hadn't been really done before. Yeah. Yeah, I was very interested in, um, in talking a little bit about, so, you know, our in our introduction to Unequal Exchange, we talked about how Emmanuel has these two main presuppositions to the theory of unequal exchange, which is the mobility of capital, the mobility of capital on the international level and immobility of labor on the international level. And Ricardo on page 71 in the, the chapter on foreign trade and his principles of political economy, he says, in one and the same country, profits are generally speaking always on the same level or differ only as the employment of capital may be more or less secure. It is not so between different countries. If the profits of capital employed in Yorkshire should exceed those of the capital employed in London, capital would speedily move from London to Yorkshire and an equality of profits would be affected. But if in consequence of the diminished rate of production in the lands of England, from the increase of capital and population, wages should rise and profits fall, it would not follow the capital and population would necessarily move from England to Holland or Spain or Russia where profits might be higher. And on the very next page, he also has a quote where he says that when he's talking about England and Portugal, on the other hand, though, it would be undoubtedly be advantageous to the capitalists of England and to the consumers in both countries that under such circumstances, the wine and the cloth should both be made in Portugal and that the capital and labor of England employed in making cloth should be removed to Portugal. This is in like a hypothetical situation if it's advantageous in Portugal. In that case, the relative value of these commodities should be regulated by the same principle as if one were the produce of Yorkshire and the other of London. And in every other case, if capital freely flowed to those countries where it could be most profitably employed, there could be no difference in the rate of profit and no other difference in the real or labor price of commodities. He, he says, however, that experience shows this is not the truth. But these quotes were, were very interesting to read, considering a lot of the debates that Emmanuel is, is discussing in Unequal Exchange have to do with that question of the, the immobility of capital at, a, at a, an international level and the debate around the equalization of the rate of profit at an international level. And Ricardo's conclusion that capital is ultimately immobile at the international level, I wanted to ask you how you think that it, that influenced his support for comparative advantage, whereas Emmanuel sees, and especially we see today, that exactly what Ricardo said about, oh, you, can just move, you can't just move capital to a different country once the rate of profit starts to fall. Well, to some extent, we have with the modern system of like the global value chain and the, the global labor arbitrage, to some extent that has happened with the movement and deindustrialization in, in the global north. So yeah, I was curious what you think about that. Yeah, so I mean, uh, Ricardo, in his model, uh, he assumes immobility of labor and also immobility of capital, uh, which means that there's no competition uh, between countries of labor or of capital. I mean, although for Ricardo, strictly speaking, the immobility of labor doesn't actually matter because Ricardo just thought that labor, I mean, wages would be the same in every country and that would be the biological minimum. Like, I mean, that's kind of a classic sort of economists of his era thought that, uh, that there could be some, you know, differences in, in monetary wages for various uh, price level differences and so on. But um, yeah, I think for his area, for his era, uh, in terms of mobility of capital, which probably relatively correct in our in our era it's definitely not correct uh even as late as uh, emmanuel has various figures i mean emmanuel thinks that even in the 19th century and so on it wasn't really true and at the end of the 19th century beginning of 20th century definitely wasn't true we have lots of capital mobility and of course emmanuel's thesis is that you have mobility of capital which means equal profit rates uh but immobility of labor which means hugely very, uh, very, uh, uh, you know, wages, which is the whole basis of unequal exchange theory. In terms of the 
effect of, Amer of Ricardo's suppositions on his theory. Um, I think this is one of the reasons why he moves away from the labor theory of value in analyzing international price formation, because since there aren't the same, there aren't the same, uh, there's not competition, basically, uh, capital competi competition of capital is no, his whole model of capitalist price formation in the domestic stage, uh, domestic uh, level, depends on the equalization of rates of profit which is also the same for Marx as well. But since this isn't true for the international level, he can't really look at international price formation using his materialist labor theory of value, which is why he takes this whole like comparative cost rubbish. And it's also worth noting that, uh, yeah, I mean, the way that each country actually, the, the, the mechanism through which each country specializes in something different is, the, is not at all really you know, capitalist competition, but it's through the quantity theory of money. Uh, by which basically the country with lots of which more productive exports more, but then it has more export revenue, which then inflates prices, which then makes it less competitive. And then the other country has something to specialize in, uh, which lots of economists have sort of found that doesn't really work in reality. And uh, there's not much reason to believe that this is actually true. Um, but I would say, though, that in terms of this, the supposition of uh, capital immobility and labor immobility. This is kind of a good segue, I think, into the more modern iteration of comparative cost theory, which is uh, the work of uh, Bertel, Olin, Bertel Olin and Eli Heckscher, which are two very influential, uh, basically Swedish economists in the 1920s, 1930s, um, who kind of renovated Ricardo's theory. They didn't really change it that much. They just sort of made it stupider and worse uh, because they yeah. sort of adapted it basically to neoclassical uh, economics, which is very like, you know, anti-labor theory of value. Everything is based on demand and like, you know, and all this sort of other, other, other rubbish. And, uh, but what is interesting is that they tried to integrate capital mobility into it. Um, but it doesn't really end up changing that much. They, they also try and look at um, the fact that there are wage differentials, but their whole conclusion is just that when you have trade, this acts as a, basically a, a, a kind of a, a simulation essentially of labor mobility. And so their conclusion is just that the more trade, the more that wages everywhere will equalize and will have a happy equal world. And uh, the reason trade is caused by these inequalities, and then the more trade we'll have, the less inequality there will be, and so on. So obviously, it's very, very popular and very much loved by modern economic theory and IMF and the World Bank and so on. Um, so yeah, you, you can sort of you can change uh, Ricardo's prepositions a little bit in terms of mobility, but then if you keep this whole, because I mean. Ha uh, Hexer and Olin, they also keep the whole quantity theory of money and explaining how, you know, they have the same conclusion as, as Ricardo, basically, which is that even if one country is more productive in all sectors than other countries, each country will still have something to specialize in because the more productive country will get too much export revenue and then the prices will rise and then it will be unproductive and then everyone is happy. So they have kind of this similar explanation as, as Ricardo. Um, so in a sense as well, I mean, you know, if, if your aim is to apologize for like free trade imperialism, you can, you'll, you'll find a way, even, no matter the suppositions, essentially. Um, yeah. Yeah, th this may be a little bit of a, not a detour, but I think one, one of the things that is always very interesting to me is that Emmanuel and Berlin talks about this very explicitly, is how I almost see it as like Emmanuel is trying to say well imperialism isn't just uh like this kind of mercantile or like investment imperialism this this kind of like traditional view especially that's what Berlin talks about with like emmanuel's criticisms of, of lenin to some extent of saying no you should go even further like free trade is actually an imperial system as well and Berlin talks about how to some extent a lot of the different Marxists had a kind of ambivalent view to free trade or didn't know what to make of it because they were, were kind of traditionally educated and like monopoly is the biggest 
expression of imperialism and monopoly finance capital is, is the problem. And so it didn't go further to see the ways like a kind of like like all this language that Ricardo and Olin used to some extent, right? Like the universal benefits of free trade to all all of mankind. Um, and there's almost some kind of way in which that like I think uh, I know Brolin talks about this, but they see free trade as like, oh, it can actually kind of like bring all of humanity into like the shared commerce and whatever. And then I kind of like, I don't know, is more beneficial than this kind of traditional mercantile colonial system. But I wonder what you think about that, that Emmanuel strikes me as, as attempting to extend this, like you said, the labor theory of value to criticize free trade. Yeah, I mean, with, with the Marxists as well, I'll just add that I mentioned Ricardo's whole fear that raw, raw materials prices would continue rising and sort of ruin capitalism. And uh, and this is actually a, a view shared by lots of Marxists. Um, and Nikolai Bukharin, for example, the really famous uh, you know, Bolshevik uh, theorist, was a very, very influential theorist, and very, at the time, very famous uh, you know, Marxist uh theorist of imperialism and so on. He also thought that uh, the prices of raw materials should continue to rise relative to the price of uh, industrial goods, and which would you know, sort of be bad for capitalism. And he thought that would be a cause for imperialism because the imperialist countries would have to search for to control for um, raw, <coughs> raw material areas uh, to control the prices. But in reality, and this is the whole sort of prepositional hypothesis and then out of which Emmanuel's work comes from is that in reality, the prices for raw materials, many of which were exported by low wage countries, kept on falling relative to industrial goods, which kind of puts in question so many of these assumptions held by economists regarding the, um, if not the beneficial role of free trade, then it's sort of non-biased nature against the poor countries. So that's one aspect of it. One thing that Emmanuel's work, Emmanuel, I mean, this is kind of a common criticism as well of the free trade herd of cost argument, is that it assumes this very static, I guess, view of economic progress. And it just sort of says, and I mean, Olin says this all the time in this really like kind of stupid way where he says like, you know, different countries have different factor endowments, which means that some countries have more land, some countries have, uh, you know, more workers than the wages are lower. Um, but the, he just assumes this in this very uh, ahistorical way. So he says, like, in Australia, they have been endowed, like, by who? By God or whatever, right? They've been endowed with lots of land and few laborers. But in reality, right, they were the genocide, right? And they killed all the natives and then they had lots of land for the whites. And because of that, there were high wages. But he just says, oh, but they've been endowed with this and this dictates they specialize in this. And then he'll say, and then the next example is just insane. He says, like, Germany has been endowed with a high amount of educated chemists, which dictates they specialize in chemical chemical industry. <laughs> and yeah, Emmanuel, so sort of joke, jo Emmanuel jokes about this, actually. I mean, he criticized this. It's, like, ridiculous. I mean, Germany had, like, state support for industry and for, you know, specialization and all these different high, you know, advanced sectors of industry, including chemical industry. That's why it has, that's why it has these, uh, you know, these, these uh, chemical engineers. But so basically, and, and just there's this assumption that this is all natural, but in reality, it's not natural, you know, and, and that, you know, one aspect of, you know, free trade dominance is that first, you know, Britain was, mercantilist and protectionist for centuries. And then when it was able to just win by even in free trade, then it just got everyone to open up the free trade. And so it could deindustrialize them all and you know have them as the best markets possible and so on. Um, so there's that and there's there's also the aspect in which the the uh, comparative cost theory just doesn't take into account the possibility of unemployment at all. It really assumes that uh, you know there's maximal uh, you know consumption but what about unemployment, right? If you have this change in uh, industrial specialization, what if before everyone was employed in industry and you have 5 million people, but then you start specializing in you know, agriculture, uh, large-scale agriculture, you, know, you only need like you know 500,000 workers. What happens to the other 4.5 million workers that have no jobs anymore? This is just not discussed at all by 
uh, comparative cost theory and a manual. And many writers have noted this about about a uh, you know liberal free trade theory, which is very relevant nowadays in terms of you know, unemployment, say, and the un well in the first world they comp they complain about it a lot because you know, of Chinese you know competition and so on. But this is also just a common problem throughout the third world as well, uh, where when they have to they're forced to open up their borders to free trade and then they just lose all the industrial jobs and results in really huge social social unrest. Um, and um, I, I would just, there's one thing that I also wanted to mention, which is really interesting about Owen, which is that just like uh, Ricardo and his context of justifying Britain's free trade imperialism, and then also critiquing previous views that held that free trade wouldn't always be mutually beneficial. Owen was also responding to, he was writing in the 1920s, 30s, when there was lots of economic nationalism in Europe, Central and Eastern Europe, and there was a, there's a really fascinating writer, uh, Mikhail uh, uh, Manolescu, and he was this Romanian. I mean, he's, he's a very weird guy. He he ended up being the Ministry of Economy in fascist Romania in World War II, and he like because he, he, I mean, whole thing was being this ultra protectionist, and he wrote all these books about it and stuff. And then allied with Hitler, and he was just like, okay, no, it doesn't matter. Romania should just export materials to Germany, uh, which is kind of funny. But um, but Manuel Lescu wrote kind of the first, basically like the first book in economic history, I guess after mercantilism, that was purely justifying protectionism in a long-term sense, and in particular for poor countries, because he's Romanian, talking about Romania's problems is this, you know, in free trade, it just it's forced to become this agricultural. Um, you know, appendage of the industrial countries. And so he has this whole system of protectionism and why protectionism is necessary, not just in the short term, which economists had admitted before, but in the long term as well. And his ideas would actually become very influential in the third world, uh, in Latin America in the 1930s. And then they would actually influence one of the really important influences for unequal exchange theory in general, actually. And Emmanuel talks about his work as well. But Olin was really critiquing him quite a lot. Uh, in, and he reviewed him and he really hated this, like, oh, this idiot this you know, trying to show that free trade isn't good. So there's there's a really interesting historical context to, um, to Olin as well, in terms of the whole justifying free trade as not being inherently imperialist. Yeah, definitely. With Olin, yeah, like you mentioned, you're, you're struck reading it just how much he uses Australia as an example. And literally every time I would read it and read him saying, like he says, Australia has an abundant supply of agricultural land, but a scanty population. Land is cheap and wages are high in comparison with most other countries. And and using this as a justification, almost like the, yeah, and I, what I like about Emmanuel, we'll talk more, you know, with unequal exchange, um, the wage differentials are such a big part of the theory, but his explanation that wage differentials aren't aren't just created in this in this vacuum of like when you have a low population and a, a large amount of land, but they have this historical and moral element as well that could allow countries like Australia uh, and countries like the U.S. to have high wages, which have to do like you mentioned with indigenous dispossession, genocide. But then when he mentions later on in the chapter on the effects of interregional trade, he has this part where he says, um, so these countries have a, 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 a cheaper supply of land. That's like his whole his whole thesis. And then he says, wheat will be imported from regions which have an abundant supply of land and are therefore able to increase their production of wheat by adding comparatively little capital and labor. Much wheat for the British Isles is grown in Argentina with the use of less capital and labor than it would require in Great Britain. At the same time, many, manufact many manufactured articles for Argentina for Argentine consumption are produced with a similar saving in Great Britain with its wealth of coal, iron, and labor. Uh, and then, again, like we were discussing with Ricardo, he, but as you mentioned this time, he does float the possibility that um, were the mobility of the production factors among the regions free, a leveling of their prices and a more efficient combination of them could be brought about through movement from a region where some of them were cheap to others where they were dear. This movement would diminish their supply and thus raise their prices, 
in the former region increase their supply and lower their prices in the other regions. For example, a transfer of British coal and iron mines and labor to Argentina would tend to equalize their factory supplies and their prices. It's very interesting with this notion of the mobility, and, and in his case, even saying that labor as a factor could hypothetically be mobile. But I wonder when I mean when I think of like a British transfer of capital and labor to Argentina, one thing that comes to mind is like is colonialism as an idea, right? Like we could we could hypothetically export laborers to other parts of the world and then have them specialize in one form of production or the other. Of course, today like with, as you mentioned, with neoliberalism, it's not as fashionable to literally export the workers themselves um, as under like settler colonialism, but instead to export capital to actually move the the production shops to low wage countries and then just have an available exploitable supply of labor. So yeah, with Olin, I'm, I'm curious, as you mentioned that while while he does, and then he has, of course, this graph, like the A and B graph, which we can, I don't know, put like an image of, uh, which is his whole idea that like over time, if you follow this system of factor endowment specialization, prices will equalize on the international scale of commodities in one country or another. And I wonder what you think of that, that to some extent he believes, maybe more than Ricardo, that mobility is possible that there's never a, a, a full equalization of prices, but at the same time, by having this kind of specialization in what you're endowed by God or by nature or whatever with, or by colonialism, of course, you can achieve this kind of balancing out on an international scale. I mean, Olin's theory is very, um, you know, he kind of does this crafty thing. He said that there's a tendency towards equalization of the uh, price of factors, so the tendency towards equalization of wages and so on. But, you know, it's slowed down by various uh, factors. But basically, his ultimate answer is that the more trade you have, the more equalization of factor prices there will be. So you can just sort of claim, you know, if there's still inequality in wages, it's because there hasn't been enough trade. There needs to be more trade, uh, which is you know, the neoliberal liberal answer uh, when it comes to international inequality and so on. And they'll point to various ways in which there's still been lots of protectionism and, you know, free trade has never been tried. Uh, it's kind of like when, you know, I guess anti-communists will always say, oh, you know, you communists, you always say that real communism has never been tried. And you, uh, you say that, uh, you know, there's still a better communism and you try and dissociate yourself from the existing historical communism. But then, you know, you have these free traders like, oh, no, we, we just, you know, there's inequality now. That's because there's not enough free trade. We haven't tried, we haven't tried real free trade yet. Um, that's kind of the, the, uh, the direction, I guess, of, of Olin's work. So even if you do say like, oh, Olin, you're wrong, there's still wage differences. He'll say, yes, there are wage differences. And that's why there's trade, because trade occurs when you have this, uh, this difference in cheapness because of uh, difference in price because of different factor endowments. And then when there's more trade, these differences in price will get slowly evened out, but it takes a long time and there's various you know, counter tendencies. But overall tendency, the more trade, the more equal. So that's kind of the sense of that. Yeah, on the note of wage differentiation, I, I want to turn to two quotes from the two texts. Um, the first is going back a second with Ricardo. I don't know if you if you caught this whole. I think it's page forty seven, uh, at least in my edition. He had this whole part where he's talking about like almost like the English standard of living. Um, so he says, it is, "This is the chapter on wages and principles of political economy." He says, uh, "It is not to be understood that the natural price of labor, estimated even in food and necessaries." is absolutely fixed and constant. It varies at different times in the same country and very materially different in different countries. It essentially depends on the habit and customs of the people. An English laborer would consider his wages under their natural rate and too scanty to support a family if they enabled him to purchase no other food than potatoes or to live and to live in no better habitation than a mud cabin. Yet these moderate demands of nature are often deemed sufficient in countries where, quote, man's life is cheap and his wants easily satisfied. 
Many of the conveniences now enjoyed in an English cottage would have been thought luxuries at an earlier period of our history. So Ricardo's thoughts on wages and then something immediately comparable with Olin is in the chapter on effects of interregional trade on page 32. He he says he's talking about specialization and, and you know why we would have this division of labor. And he says, and the same applies to labor. A man with a ten thousand dollar salary will not be used at a job that a three thousand dollar man can handle almost as well. A banker does not do his typing himself, even if he is better at it than his typist. One will always prefer to use a greater quantity of a cheaper factor than a smaller quantity of a dearer one, if the total costs are lower that way. The combination of raw materials and half finished goods follows the same principle. Yeah, so I found this this very interesting compared with with everything we're seeing, right? Like where their conception of wage differentials originates from. And to some extent, it is a they have this kind of implicit acknowledgement of the whole historical and moral element where they they are sort of saying like some people are valued at a, at a higher rate, like almost this this kind of like ten thousand dollar man versus three thousand dollar man, or the the man whose life is cheap. That sort of language is very is almost naturalizing of wage differentials to some extent, and always justifying it as what you know society believes you're afforded to. But of course, Emmanuel will flip this on its head and say, "What well, that exact same logic is what allows us to say that some people are just naturally forced to work at a very low wage." For cheap labor because that's just that's just like the the assumption is that that's the way the world naturally works but of course the truth is we've imposed these conditions on the third world in particular yeah so when you're asking about um that really gets back to what you're asking about before with uh emmanuel's conception of free trade imperialism and there are lots of aspects to it um you know, and it's it's definitely really important in the context of, as you were saying, how lots of Marxists, I mean, Marx himself, um, sort of championed free trade as this way that it would it would sharpen contradictions in the in global capitalism, and it would, you know, create more, more proletarians and so on and so on. Um, but Emmanuel's critique of free trade, I think, there's two general aspects to it. Just first of all, as you said, there are these whole kind of the historical context of free trade, which is that, sure, you can have free trade now, and then coincidentally, Britain will just dominate everything. Um, but what about the context before, which is that Britain was very protectionist and so on and so on for centuries, and uh, and then forced the other countries to be its colonies and to be totally deindustrialized and so on. And if you remove that context, then then you sort of can't understand the present, where even if you have total free trade now, uh, it'll still result in Britain winning. So that's one aspect. Uh, I think there's another aspect where, um, I mean, Emmanuel talks about this uh, at certain points, but um, it was also that even in so-called free trade, there's still there are still so many protectionist aspects imposed by the uh, rich countries and through various free trade agreements that are very uh, unequal and biased towards the rich country, uh, especially, you know, you can see this really well with EU free trade agreements. For example, with with Ukraine, which uh, has been uniquely catastrophic in that country in a huge amount of ways, but it also was very, very, very biased towards uh, the EU, where it just it banned basically Ukraine from uh, from exporting industrial goods, but it allowed Europe to export all these different industrial goods to Ukraine and so on. So there's all these different kind of non very not very free trade protectionist aspects of so called free trade. And then the last part of this critique um, is that free trade just by itself um, leads to this uh, exacerbation of um, inequality. Well, you know, I think with Olin, you can say, okay, sure, there's been this historical inequality and so on and so on, and you have these different wages. But if we have free trade, free trade will iron out these differences. This is kind of the whole idea, which is that, oh, you know, the more free trade we have, then that means that, you know, American wages will become kind of close to Chinese wages. Chinese wages will become close to American wages, something like that, in the middle, I suppose. But the most, I guess, important part of Emmanuel's theory is that actually you can have free trade based on inequality 
And then it won't lead to a narrowing of the gap. It can lead to even an exacerbation of the gap because you have unequal exchange where the, uh, the richer countries with the higher wages, they will end up exporting, get, getting higher export revenues because of the overvaluation of their exports through unequal exchange in the low, lower countries, vice versa. And then also various different benefits due to having high wages that Emmanuel writes about in his work that create this kind of positive feedback effect for high wage countries and negative feedback, negative feedback effect for low wage countries. And this is something that's just totally not considered by all I mean, for them, they just think that, you know, you have more trade, more competition, wages will equalize, and that, that's basically it. Um, so I think that's kind of how I would explain the difference between them in terms of Manuel's critique of free trade ideology. Yeah, and, and I think we can get into this as we are reading Unequal Exchange more and talking more about the ideas, but yeah, something that is a big takeaway, I think, as you're pointing out throughout this is the the almost like do as I say, not as I do kind of model for the industrialized high wage countries where they were afforded a, a period of colonialism, mercantilism, protectionism, and yet consistently rule that out as a, a possibility for the rest of the world. Um, and the, and the, yeah, the interesting thing that this is the way that capitalism rose in Europe was through this system. And yet, the, so this is basically precluding the possibility of a, a kind of like capitalist rise for other countries to some extent. And Emmanuel, you know, at different points in the EU will talk about, for example, the like the possibility of a, a, a kind of like cartel for the, the third world countries if they like organize together around commodities that they have control over to some extent as possible alternatives. But yeah, this again, this then becomes, I think, like a big debate in Emmanuel's thought and his like political thought of what route to take for uh, for the third world countries, whether they should pursue uh, a sort of like integration into free trade and work within it, promote some form of mercantilism. Um, I'd love to, you know, even discuss how it relates to the debate that Emmanuel and Samir Amin had around the question of delinking and like what in what way should delinking be taken that isn't like an autarkic kind of like remove oneself from the international economy because that wasn't seen as a realistic possibility for these countries but was was proposed as like the kind of ideal goal to some extent. 